In 2012, an ambitious 24-year-old South African set out on a solo adventure down the Amazon River. Just two months into the expedition, the serene river life abruptly turned into a harrowing fight for survival. In an instant, he found himself struggling alone in the jungle. He had over 20 shotgun pellets to his heart, skull, and lungs. Where do you turn for help in one of the most remote areas in the world? Especially when you have major injuries, each of which could bring you moments away from death. This is the story of Davy Duplessis. Davy Duplessis was born in 1988 in Cape Town, South Africa. He spent his youth in Durban, South Africa, where he developed his adventurous side of life. He had an early love for ocean and surfing, and he just all around loved being outdoors. And Davy realized early on that he didn't want the regular nine to five job. For a time, he worked in the maritime industry, and then he had a business where he sold plant-based foods, but they weren't a big hit with the people of South Africa at the time. And this is when Davy started to really look at what he wanted to do with his life. He felt that he had these ideas and teachings and he wanted to share them with the world. But he also realized that he was pretty young and he lacked the credibility necessary that would make anyone want to listen to him. If you have something important to say, no one's going to listen to you until you have some credibility in some sphere of something. So I had to create my own platform and that I found easiest through adventure. He wasn't this huge like, guy who was totally in love with adventures and this extreme adventurer from toddlerhood. He thought that adventure could be a platform for promoting what he believed in. It could be a source of revenue for developing a business. He could become a public speaker through it. And he thought that he could become an author and write some books after his adventures. And Davy was a vegan at the time and part of his reason for choosing adventures was to use it as a platform to promote that someone can do these grueling, hard activities while retaining a good health while living as a vegan. While he was working at that market, the opportunity to cycle Africa popped up. Even though Davy grew up in South Africa, he hadn't really traveled much around the continent, so him and his cycling companion, Ricky, they planned to travel through nine of the 56 African countries. They wanted to use their experience to highlight and encourage more travel throughout Africa. And as they were heading out on their trip, at that time there was a lot of political and social unrest in Africa. Now they knew that they had to be careful and they tried to be careful, but in the first two days of cycling Egypt, they got mugged twice. Then a police officer was assigned to them and he drove slowly behind them for the rest of their trip through Egypt. Then they cycled through Ethiopia and it was slow and tough going and it was worsened by the harassment of locals who would sometimes throw stones at them. And that's where Davy got into an altercation when a man stole Davy's hat off of his head and then the man ran off into the village. So Davy tore off after him and tackled him and they had a bit of a small skirmish and before they knew what was happening, they were totally surrounded by locals and men were pulling them apart and the crowd that was growing started to get pretty volatile and it became quite a dangerous situation. Davy managed to get his hat back in the ruckus and ran back to his bike and they took off as fast as they could. Now understandably, Davy was shaken after that. He was reminded of the vulnerability induced by adventure. And it was just one more reminder for them to be constantly aware and vigilant of everything that was going on around them. Then they got to Tanzania and that's where they saw the highlights of the typical African experience. They cycled near Mount Kilimanjaro. They saw the ocean for the first time since they left. And then they started cycling through a game preserve and got the taste of the typical African wildlife. They saw zebras, giraffes, elephants, and it was just an amazing experience. After a few months of cycling, they reached the border of South Africa and were back home. Despite the challenges, Davy was absolutely hooked on the experience that adventure gave him. He realized that the adventure provided him with all these opportunities and he was pushed out of his comfort zone and it gave him that test of character for which he really wanted. He said he had gained so much personally and they also did some fundraising for Habitat for Humanity so he felt the trip was entirely worth it. So soon after he started to plan his next adventure and he never realized to what degree he would be pushed way out of his comfort zone. Davy was drawn to the Amazon forest from the moment he watched his first wildlife documentary as a kid. 
the idea of exploring the plant and animal life in the Amazon just fascinated him and he knew he wanted to go there. So he started planning his trip to the Amazon. He gathered as much information as he could about the Amazon, but he knew virtually nothing about it. He had to question really basic things like how long was the Amazon River? What were the possible dangers and potential highlights? Has anyone done it before and what were the best ways of navigating it? I was attempting to navigate the Amazon River from its source to the sea in a bid to promote an individual take action towards the many environmental issues faced by our natural world. So we spent the next year planning the Amazon trip. Now the origin of the Amazon, it's kind of been hard to pin down. Explorers and scientists have argued over the start of where the Amazon began. There's multiple rivers that have been given the honor over the years. And today the Amazon isn't considered to have one unique source, but a number of sources. But the one Davy started at was kind of one that was acknowledged as being one of the main sources. And it started at Mount Mismi in Peru. Oh, this is Dean Jacobs coming to you from the birthplace of the Amazon, high in the Andes at almost 17,000 feet. This mountain had a trickle of water and from that eventually led into the, one of the accepted sources of the Amazon, the Apurimac River. This meant that he would start high in the challenging and very cold Peruvian Andes. Davy decided to split the adventure into three stages. The first stage would be a hike to the summit of Mount Mismi. In the second stage, he'd cycle about 800 kilometers alongside the river through the Peruvian Andes. After that, he'd reach flat water and begin the third and final stage, a 5,700 kilometer paddle to the Atlantic Ocean. In many of these stories I do about adventurers, and especially the video on Emma Kelty, who also did the Amazon River, people ask how they afforded it. And lucky for us, Davy was quite open about it. At this point in the trip, he had the trip planned. It was all coming together slowly, but he needed financial backing and had yet to secure it. He knew that his daily cost while on the river would be minimal, but the equipment, flights, insurance, and all the other logistics required significant funding. So he began to search for sponsors to see if they would want to support his incredibly worthwhile project, as he deemed it. He felt it was a win-win that the sponsor would be affiliated with him, someone embarking on this epic adventure for a worthy cause, and Davy saw it as kind of a no-brainer. It was just a win-win for everybody. He expected the companies to come flooding in with offers, but nobody responded. And that's when he realized just how naive he was about this whole process. He did have previous sponsors from the cycling trip that he did, and he managed to re-sign a small contract with them. He also got a couple other sponsorships that were just for products like shoes and mosquito spray, but not much monetary value to them. And time was running out. He only had a few more months to go before the departure date, and without that final sponsorship, the trip just wouldn't happen. So Davy discussed the project almost daily with his entire family. He probably drove them crazy talking about this crazy Amazon trip all the time. And this eventually it wore down his stepfather and he offered to sponsor the whole trip. He was actually pretty excited about it too because he shared Davy's whole vision of the trip and wanted it to work out for him. Just after a year of planning, everything came together in the final few months. And shortly after his 24th birthday, he said his goodbyes to friends and family and headed to the Amazon. None of his friends or family had any idea of the struggle and terror that Davy was about to experience. So Davy arrived in Lima with his bike and gear and he was all eager to hike up that mountain. He made his way to this small town and began the hike. Mount Mismi is a 5,597 meter mountain peak. Reaching the summit would be the official start of his adventure. He would leave his bike in town while he hiked to the summit and then he would return and start the cycling portion. While he was getting ready for his hike, he was talking to this local who had told him that a couple had died earlier hiking that exact same route. And she warned him about the dangers and urged him to find an experienced guide. She was really worried about him. 
But after his Africa cycle, Davy had actually become used to the locals warning him about areas that he found were never really an issue. So he started to kind of take that information from locals with a grain of salt. The irony was when we left South Africa, all our relatives, all our friends, everyone was saying, you're crazy, it's dangerous, you're going to be killed or something like that. When we got there, it wasn't like that. So then with the Amazon, this is why I started to think when I was in Sudan that these adventures aren't as bad as people say they are. Every time people say there's danger, very, very seldom is there danger. And the irony is South Africa is one of the most violent places in the world. So then I just started to think, well, maybe people are just going to say all these adventures are crazy and dangerous because they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. So when I went to the Amazon, people were also saying it's dangerous. Um, bad stuff happens there. But by this time, I'd been used to it. I'd been told this pretty much through every country we went through on that Africa trip. So I was used to that. And I'd just block it out. I'd just be like, this is just the opinions of people who don't know what okay. is out there. This local woman kept insisting that he not go alone and finally told him that if he went alone, he would die and he wouldn't make it back. But he ended up thanking her and going on his merry way. So this hike was probably going to take him a few days. So he brought a tent and some camping gear, cooking gear, and he headed on his way. The first night was really, really cold. Davy had never camped in minus temperatures before, and he hadn't even taken into consideration how cold these first few days would be. He said, that night I lay frozen in my sleeping bag with my numb toes, keeping me awake most of the night. He was also really hungry, but just too cold to cook anything on his camp stove. After a long and arduous slog, he finally reached the summit. He was alone, there was no other sign of human life near him, no planes in the sky. No sound to be heard. He really felt like he was on top of the world. This was the highest point that he'd ever reached. And just like that, stage one was officially complete. As Davy was about to start the cycling portion, he met a truck driver who told him of a better and faster route than he had planned. However, the trucker neglected to mention that the roads were in really poor condition. Davy's lack of route information combined with the poor roads, high altitudes and freezing conditions made things really challenging and showed just how underprepared he was. On his first day, he cycled for eight hours and only made it 25 kilometers. He was really angry at himself and he said he just felt like the worst cyclist in the world. In the next week, he averaged only 35 kilometers a day and the cycling didn't get any easier. It was high altitude and there was constant climbing and steep descents. His original plan was to cycle another 180 kilometers, but while cycling, he was able to look at the river and he checked out the rapids and he thought, those actually look pretty timid and easy and I could probably do those. So he decided to start paddling early. Stage two was now complete. By this time, Davy had spent nearly a month navigating his way through the Peruvian Andes and it was only heading into this third stage that he kind of started to feel like the adventure was really beginning, even though three and a half months paddling lay ahead of him. And he had some apprehension going into this final stage. What if he didn't make it to the end? Did he overestimate his abilities to actually paddle the Amazon River? But he was kind of committed now, it was pretty tough to get out of where he was. And he was finally embarking on that true test of character that he was looking for. Now for the paddle, Davy was going to be using a foldable kayak since they're easier to transport and cheaper to mail across the globe. And it was a touring kayak able to carry a paddler as well as equipment, but it was primarily designed for flat open water. And the rapids he'd seen up to this point were pretty much just class one and class two rapids, so pretty intermediate at the most. Just before he started the paddling portion, Davy met a German couple whose son had tragically died in the river 10 years earlier. In really similar circumstances, their son and a friend decided to build a raft and float down river. Their son fell out during one of the most challenging rapids and was never seen again. And to add to the danger, this stretch was known to be swarming with fully operational members of the Shining Path, a local terrorist organization. A month before this, a group of 30 civil workers were kidnapped by the Shining Path. The German couple told Davy that the fear amongst the locals was the worst that they'd have ever experienced and they'd been coming back to this area for decades. And Davy was kind of oblivious to the danger because he was just kind of pa- or cycling and hiking on his own. So once again, he kind of decided not to give it much more consideration. But he did have reservations about paddling. Davy had never paddled a river of this magnitude before, nor had he ever used a foldable kayak. 
But despite his anxiety, he set off down the river. So he set off on the Yurubamba River, and that's in the valley that is also known as a sacred valley, and it's the gateway to Machu Picchu. And the river's popular among tourists as a rafting destination. As Davy entered that first set of rapids, he immediately realized that he had grossly underestimated the power and size of the rapids, as well as the fragility of that little foldable kayak. He was really close to capsizing the kayak, but luckily made it out unscathed. And that was only the tip of the iceberg. There were much bigger rapids to come. Once he got past those first rapids, he was pretty scared and doubtful that he could make it through more rapids, so he actually considered finding some way out of there. So the next option was to walk the kayak downriver while walking on the shore. He would just have a line attached to the kayak. And that actually worked pretty well. He was able to do this for the rest of the day until he got to this big set of rapids that he couldn't get by on shore. So he'd have to paddle through. He took this deep breath and he jumped in the kayak and paddled as hard as he could to the other side which looked a little bit safer. But moments into the paddle across, he felt this massive, powerful undertow take hold of the kayak, which pulled him down river sideways and directly into the rapids. Then wham, he hit a submerged rock and in the blink of an eye was catapulted out of the kayak. And by the way, it's worth mentioning here that Davy didn't even bring a life jacket. For some reason, he didn't think he'd need one while paddling the full Amazon River. But luckily, he still had a hold of his paddle, which was attached to the kayak, so he was able to pull himself onto the kayak and float it down river. He realized that he was in way over his head. He still had more than 60 kilometers of rapids to go. And this was only day one on the river. He was angry at himself for impulsively deciding to paddle early and realized that he put himself in a pretty huge amount of danger. He wondered if there was a road that followed the river that he could just run along for the next 60 kilometers, but there wasn't. So he set up camp and would try to figure out a solution overnight. Just as he was starting to drift off in his tent, he froze in fear when a man banged on the tent and blinded him with this light. Fortunately, he was a friendly fella and kindly came to offer Davy a blanket. They chatted for a bit and he told Davy that the next 60 kilometers would be way more challenging in terms of rapids than anything he had seen so far. So Davy, for some reason, considered swimming as another option. That would be the last option to me if rapids were that dangerous. But he thought he was a strong swimmer and that he might be able to do it. But he also thought about the German couple's son and realized it would be pretty crazy to attempt to swim rapids. There was a small town nearby and Davy spent a couple days there trying to figure out how to get past the rapids. This could make or break his entire adventure. And it was when he was stopped at this mechanic shop and chatting with the owner when he noticed this large truck tire on the floor. And that's when Davy kind of had a light bulb moment. He thought, I could use that tire tube to float down the river. Okay, if you're like me, you're probably thinking, what the crap, Davy? a tire tube, swimming? Like, what the heck? Just take a car, just fly to the next section through rapids with no life jacket, it's just insanity. Part of Davy's original plan was to hydro speed down the river. And you may be wondering what the heck is hydro speeding like I did. Basically what it is, is whitewater swimming by using a floating board and flippers. And these people who partake in this adrenaline-fueled activity say that it's a way to get closer to nature by immersing yourself in the currents, rapids, choppy waters of rivers all over the world. It requires a lot of physical exertion because you have to maneuver yourself around obstacles like giant rocks and waves. It's crazy. And most people wear a padded wetsuit helmet and have a hydro speed board. So Davy wasn't totally off and wacky about this concept of hydro speeding, although he was going to use a tire tube. In 1997, Mike Horn hydro speeded or hydro sped, <laughs> I have no idea what the proper term is, the full length of the Amazon River. He did the whole thing that way, swimming it, basically. I bet he had a life jacket though. But Davy was in close contact with Mike and talked to him a lot while he was prepping his own adventure. So he kind of had an idea how Mike did it. And that gave him the incentive to try this crazy tire tube idea. He thought it would take about 10 hours to complete that rapid section. And he felt he could do that in a single day. So he attached tie downs to the tube so he could have something to hold on to. And then he tied a rope around his waist to substitute for the lack of a life jacket. He got all set up and he was ready to go on the river again. He walked to the edge of the river, he was very nervous, obviously. 
His plan was to keep close to the riverbank and even walk along the bank when he could because that worked for him before, right? So as he said, with a small amount of trepidation and a giant leap of faith, he jumped into the river. By 6 a.m. he was well on his way. The tire tubing was actually working out. And then he came to his first rapid. His plan through the rapids was to lie on his stomach, hang onto the tube, the straps on the tube, and kick with his legs. So he passed the first small set of rapids successfully, but he really quickly realized that the tire tube, shockingly, was difficult to maneuver. This is ridiculous. And then he came to the famous Pongo de Manique, which is a geological crack in the mountain range that narrows the flow of water into this tiny gorge. And this was the spot where the German couple's son had died. Davy wasn't about to take his little tire tube through those rapids, so the only other option was to climb up above the cliffs, up above the gorge on the cliffs, along the scary and damp looking walls and go around the rapids. And these walls are massive. And so in just 10 hours of floating, walking and climbing with a painful sunburn and an empty stomach, he finally made it past the rapids. All the rapids, that was all he had to do. Davy was now in the Amazon basin and would officially begin paddling towards the sea on a nice calm river. He didn't know it at the time, but he was not going to make it much further. Davy knew that he still had a long way to go and was excited to start paddling on calmer waters. The jungle plants and animals that he just dreamed about seeing since he was a kid, they were right there in front of him now. And that night he found out that the jungle got really loud. He'd hear crashing through the trees, instantly waking up in a panic, and then he would shine his headlamp into the jungle to see if he could see anything, and all he saw looking back were small glowing eyes. Now wouldn't that give you a restful night's sleep? I don't think I'd sleep at all. The sleep that was interrupted by the animals and noises was also interrupted by locals, mostly fishermen who would wake him up and to see who he was in the middle of the night. Fortunately, all of those encounters were just them being curious rather than dangerous. But every night he would sleep with his machete, pepper spray, personal locator beacon, and a satellite phone right beside him. He settled into a routine of paddling between 7 a.m. and 5 p.m. He'd eat this big breakfast, paddle over lunch, and then have a huge dinner. In these early days, the animal sightings were minimal, but he did see a lot of river dolphins. They were inquisitive and would trail along in the small wake of his kayak. He was enjoying the company until one day a dolphin swam right under him and breached. He felt the kayak bend upwards. He didn't fall out, luckily, but after that he decided to be really mindful of the dolphins and paddle closer to the riverbanks in case that happened again. Little did he know that that decision to stick close to the riverbank would soon prove to be life-saving. As time went on, Davy settled into this comfortable routine. He was paddling. He felt pretty safe, almost as if adventuring was just becoming too easy. He was starting to think that the unknown parts of the world weren't as dangerous as people portrayed them to be. It was kind of turning out to be similar to his African cycling experience. But he couldn't help shake this feeling that things were easy now, but they would soon become much more challenging. He couldn't shake the feeling that something bad was going to happen, but hoped that those negative thoughts would just remain that, thoughts. Davy was about a four and a half day paddle from his next resupply location in Pilcalpa. As he was paddling, two men in their 20s motored by on a peke peke, which is a wooden dugout canoe with a motor that the locals used. They went by him and they didn't really say anything to him and Davy didn't really think of it because he had been seeing people on the river here and there. He just kept paddling and focused on getting downriver. Not long after they passed, he was still paddling when suddenly he felt something forceful slam into his back. The impact was so huge that he went into paralysis from his waist up and fell into the water. He was underwater and had no idea what was going on. He said his arms just seemed like they were separate from his body. He thought maybe somebody hacked off his arms because he couldn't move them. He then kicked up to the surface and threw his left arm over the kayak when he felt something immediately hit his face. That's when he realized that he'd been shot. Davy looked around and couldn't see anything. He didn't know what was going on or where it was coming from. But it's a good thing he stuck close to shore because it didn't take him long to get to the riverbank. As he was swimming to shore, he felt a third shot slam into the side of his face. Davy was bleeding profusely and thought that it was just over. He thought that he was going to die right there. As I started to accept that this was the end, I remember feeling this intense euphoria, like 
a literal high above all highs. And to put it into perspective, once I'd reached hospital, they administered morphine and the high I received while I sat on that riverbank expecting that I was going to die quadrupled that of the morphine. Once I was feeling this high, and the more I let go and accepted that death was eventually a few breaths away, the euphoria just intensified, and it was during this euphoric stage that I was distracted by this man just slowly putting up river in his boat. The two individuals were the people who had passed him earlier. They had separated, one remained in the boat and the other was somewhere in the jungle. Davy looked to the guy in the boat who was actually had turned around and was slowly motoring towards him. You know, I saw him and I jumped up and I like prayed. I was like, please just, just leave me alone. You can take my stuff. Uh, and for three seconds, I saw this look in a human that I've never seen. And it, it, uh, it was like no compassion. It was the scariest thing I'd ever seen. The man in the boat looked on the shore and gave a slight nod to his accomplice, who was now in the jungle somewhere near Davy. And at that moment, Davy felt this surge of adrenaline jolt through his body, and he just ran. He knew he had to get the heck out of there. But first, he wanted to set off his personal locator beacon because he wanted people to know where he was and that he was in trouble. So as he started to go towards his kayak, he felt this slam into his leg. They had shot him again in the leg. He had no time to get to the kayak, so he just booked it into the jungle. He ran and ran, and he could feel his left leg seizing from the shot. His breathing was heavy and strained. His arms were locked at his side, which made running really difficult. He kept looking back as he was running, hoping the attackers weren't chasing him through the thick mud. He zigged and zagged, not sure where to go, but stuck close to the river so he wouldn't get lost. He was overwhelmed, and when his body had had enough, he collapsed into the thick mud. He couldn't believe what was happening. He was going to rot and die in the jungle alone with no one knowing what had happened to him. Davy was kind of stuck in this internal struggle. He had this desire to live, but it was fighting against the reality of this horrible situation he was in. He was seriously wounded, deep in the jungle, very remote, so how is he going to get out of there? So he kind of just took stock and he started breathing and focusing on his breathing, taking these deep, slow breaths, which gave him this resurgence of life. He picked himself up from the mud and started walking and jogging. He stuck to the riverbank, hoping that a boat would come by. He pushed on for a few hundred meters, then noticed two people emerging from the jungle directly across the river. He couldn't believe what he was seeing, but were they his attackers? Or were they dangerous? He had no clue, but he had no other choice. So he tried to whistle and scream, but he couldn't make any noise. He did a kind of an awkward wave and a jump, and that was all he could do before he collapsed into the mud. And then the men noticed him. They probably weren't sure what to make of this bloodied, crazy white man in the jungle. So they got him into the boat and took him across the river to a small village hidden among the tall trees. Davy was surprised at the infrastructure that had been built in the middle of the jungle. He hadn't seen anything remotely like it from the river. And he couldn't believe how many people lived in this tiny community. There were children playing football, people walking around and gathering to chat. The entire community stopped and stared as he was ushered over. They took him to this open area with wooden benches and it was covered by this large palm thatched rooftop. Within moments, the whole community from young children to the elderly surrounded him. And this old woman with a little wrinkled face approached him with a bucket of warm water and a sponge. She slowly sat on the ground beside him and began wiping the dried mud and blood off his legs. As soon as she touched him, he said it was like it was an okay to the rest of the villagers that they could also accept him and help him. Davy felt this sense of calm wash over him from her compassion and kindness. He was able to figure out that the closest hospital was in Pukelpa and it was a day and a half away by motorized boat. This crushed Davy because he didn't think he would survive that long. He asked them to take him there immediately, but the villagers told him that they didn't have enough fuel to get him all the way there. Instead, they would take him downriver to the next community, which was bigger and had its own doctor. So they took off into the night. One of the men sat over Davy, placed his hand gently on Davy's chest and began singing softly. The man seemed to be chanting this soft, rhythmic prayer. It was soothing, relaxing, and reassuring. After about an hour, they reached the other village and the men got out and left Davy in the boat. He was in the boat for quite a while, over an hour, and he was getting really frustrated with the lack of urgency. But the villagers were discussing how to get him to the hospital. 
It was now six hours since he was shot and the pain was intensifying. His breathing increasingly became constrained and he felt his insides filling up with blood. His breathing became slower and shallower. It felt as if his lungs were only working at half capacity, which was like a gradual suffocation. Then, without warning, he began to throw up uncontrollably. He could see this dark substance coming out of his mouth and was projectile vomiting all over the boat and blankets. But this caught the attention of everyone else around him and they started working fast and started moving him down the river again. They were traveling for another few hours when the boat suddenly stopped on a steep river bank and the men got out again. But this time they took Davy out and put him down in the mud and then left him as they went into the jungle. They didn't say a word and he started to panic. He wanted to get up and follow them, but he just couldn't. As none of these indigenous tribes had the resources to get me to wait to Pukalpa, which was about a day and a half by motorized boat. So through the night, I um, was taken like a baton in a relay race. They would take me two hours to the next village, negotiate if they could take me, and then uh, I'd be passed on like that. And what had happened throughout the night is they'd take me and they'd walk me into the jungle and they'd leave me and go speak for about an hour. You know, there was no urgency, which irritated me in this situation. <laughs> Fourteen hours later, they reached a small town. He was transferred from the boat into a tuk-tuk, which meant that he had to get off the stretcher and sit upright in this tiny taxi and bounce along to the doctor. It was still dark and they had to knock on the windows to wake up the local doctor, who assessed Davy's wounds and kind of cleaned them a little bit, but he didn't do much else. And he told Davy that they didn't have the facilities there to take care of him, so they had to take another boat to the main hospital. Finally, after a jarring, last painful boat ride in 20 hours since he had been shot, they reached the main hospital in Pucallpa. They ushered him into the hospital and Davy was able to cry for the first time since he was shot. He ran through everything that happened in the previous 20 hours and just smiled in amazement at what he endured. He experienced an emotional roller coaster. He was exposed to the cruelty of humanity and also experienced the incredible care and compassion of humanity. But his troubles weren't over yet. The doctors in the hospital wouldn't do much for Davy unless he could secure payment. Davy hadn't even thought this far ahead and didn't imagine that payment would be the issue of getting help. Davy had no idea what to do. He didn't know anyone in the area, so he called his mom using the doctor's phone. She, of course, freaked out, panicked, and was worried like crazy for him, and she had no clue how to help. She was way across the world in South Africa, and her only option was to hop on the internet and try and network with people. People started responding right away and offered to help translate for her and even some who were in the area offered to go to the hospital. Davy also had an uncle who worked for a company that had workers in Pulcalpa and they were able to talk to their contacts who showed up within an hour at the hospital which is pretty freaking amazing. And then those folks were able to secure the payment that the hospital needed and they arranged for Davy to be flown to Lima where they actually had the facilities to operate on him. And Davy's mom spoke about the panic that she felt when she got word that her son was injured. And this is a really great perspective because another common comment on a lot of these adventure stories is the toll that these adventures take on families and friends. The last she heard from Davy was during that difficult part of the rapids where he was going to float on a tire tube. And she had no communication with him after that for quite a while. And she said she had anxiety of excessive proportions. She sat for many nights waiting to hear from him so that she knew he was safe. And she felt despair many times during the trip. And she knew that he was taken on this huge task with this Amazon journey. And the adventure came with huge risks, but she also realized that adventure was his true calling, so she totally supported him. She says it would have been selfish of her to hold him back because of her fears. So Davy got to Lima and doctors started working on him. They discovered that he had a pellet lodged in his heart and this was considered the most serious injury and their main priority. That pellet that was in his heart had passed through his lung and the wall of his heart. He had multiple MRI scans to see the position of the pellets in his body and track their movements. And they said later that they were amazed that he was able to run and remain conscious with those injuries. His other injuries were a punctured lung, a punctured windpipe, and a punctured carotid artery as well as severe internal bleeding. And after a month in the hospital, he was able to finally leave and go back home to South Africa. 
Back at home, Davy tried to think about why he was attacked, and then he realized that he would never be able to understand it. And there was this great, com- this great power and compassion that I hadn't fully realized, but I emerged out of that jungle without anger, without a need for revenge or, or justice, and I credit that to that power of compassion. It had completely shifted my perspective, and I had seen so much good in such a short period that it easily trumped the seemingly negative and cruel aspects of that attack. He could spend the rest of his life wondering, but to linger on those moments meant that he'd forever be a victim. He thought about all the people who had helped him and vowed that he wouldn't let two individuals distort his views about the people that he met in the jungle. Davy wrote a book, became a speaker, got married and had a couple kids. He did some more adventuring after this trip, but his last adventure was in 2017. He said, I have a family now and going away for several months is not fair to them. If you like this wild Amazon adventure, be sure to check out the first story I did on the Amazon about Emma Kelty. Two months after Emma started her trip, she headed into the red zone and shortly after, all communication from her suddenly stopped. A British woman who also attempted an Amazon solo source to sea adventure.